All right, everybody. So thank you for joining us again for another hustle chat. Um, so uh, this week, like, there's been a lot of uh, discussing about um, what to do about the business model for hostels in order to survive this period between reopening the hostel, the borders opening up again, and for leisure travel, especially, and your local market bouncing back. So this has been a, a quite a hot topic um, that our clients have been asking us and people that we've been talking to. And so, um, and Lior also been, was uh, attending a, a webinar recently that talked a lot about this and he um, also came up with a lot of ideas. We've been brainstorming a lot of ideas so that hostels can do and also think for their own uh, situation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask some, Lior some questions um, and then after he answers, feel free to um, Bounce out as well some ideas, uh, comment on what Lior said, uh, bring your own ideas uh, and share it for everybody as well. So I guess we're ready to start. So uh, Lior, do you think there, there is a need to, ch to do a change in the business model from hostels as we know them to something else uh, uh, and for how long? Yeah, so um, as Beatrice said, I um be talking to a lot of people and, and recently also joined a webinar where the focus kind of seemed to be about what to do with the hostel in the short and midterm. Uh, I guess the, the problem is, and we all are aware of it, aware, are well aware of it, is that most hostels, probably your own, are really focused on international travelers and backpackers. Um, and so we're in a situation where we're really limited to that kind of customer base because the only ones that you're gonna have are the ones that are already in your countries uh, for some reason, whether they're quarantined or whether they're digital nomads, um, homeless. And so those may come back, but it, off, it, it definitely will not be enough to sustain hostel until the borders start opening up and flights start taking off again and we get those international backpackers back into our hostel. So, I mean, there's there's been talks, we've talked about it, other people have talked about it, about options. Uh, for example, the, the worst case is to close for good. As you're here with us, I'm hoping that's not the case with you uh, or selling. The other one is to kind of hibernate. So people that have... Uh, own their own property or maybe in the situation that they can just kind of close down until tourism comes back or the international backpackers come back to the, the market and then reopen once again as they were obviously with a little bit less occupancy um, not as good results but being able to open as a hostel that you were before and not really adapt yourself to something else now many hostels can't do that just simply close off for the next six months, a year, depends on the situation and each market, but just closing off is not an option for some people and waiting for people to come back. So what do we do during this time? And it's a very good question. Um, there's many different things that we can do to kind of adapt the hostile model as we have right now uh, into something else in the short and long term. So I do think it is necessary for many cases in order to make some sort of shift, some sort of adaptation to the hostel in order to gain a different clientele than we did when we were hostels. If we just wait for backpackers to come back, the short term stays um, and to create the same kind of atmosphere, whether it's with or without social distancing, it's, it, it's gonna be that we only have a few people in the house um, it's going to be a great challenge, especially with some people trying to reach out to the local market to get local people to start using hostels uh, and to see that payoff is just going to take a long time. So I think there are certain changes that we can make in our business models as hostels and try to get different clientele at this time that will help sustain us through this time. And so that's what I would really like to talk about. And I, I do think it is something that's necessary to touch on and something that I've been touching on with clients and with other people that we've been talking to. Um, I think that answered the first questions for Beatrice, no? Yeah, it did. Uh, so I'd love to know if anybody that's uh, joining this call is thinking about changing their business model. Um, 
we're going to talk about options that you can do next. Uh, but is anybody thinking about changing the business model so far, or are you still working out that idea? Suze. Um, so I run six party hostels in, in Budapest, and I've probably done the same thing as everybody else, just going, okay, like no one's going to want to be sociable, they're not going to want to meet people, let's do the social distancing. And I think as Leo said um, the other day, that all gets really depressing. And I think that the one thing that we've realized is the probably 50 to 60 percent of our guests are from the UK, the US and Australia. So we don't have a fighting chance to be somebody we're not. Like we are just looking to survive until around this time next year and hope that it is all back to normal or whatever else. So our plan of attack is we can't change. We deal with party people. We don't have beautiful mansions and wonderful places that people would just want to stay in. We can't compete with Airbnbs. We can't compete with hotels. So we're really just hoping to be the last sociable places and get those survivors and those party people who are not scared by life and not scared by the virus and want to get back as soon as they can. But knowing that we have to somehow financially just survive and make it through until until next year. So welcome any advice that, that people have got on hanging on. So, I mean, uh, just to let everybody know that don't know Sue's or Sue, Sue's or the Budapest party hostels. Um, I personally went to Retox because I had to see it for myself. Uh, these are complete party hostels that, um, you know, as I was talking to Sue's, yeah, we, 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 it's, it's good to be able to adapt ourselves and to get new, new business in the short term and the midterm. But for, for them at Budapest party hostels, it's not something that's very feasible because they're, they're almost like, I don't know if they are, but ruin, like, I think Sue's right. Like it's ruin bars or ruin properties where it's kind of, it's the very basic, basic Ikea beds, if that. And, you know, it's people that just really come to party, um, have orgies. <laughs> and uh, it's not something that the amount of investment that Sue's and the Budapest party hostels would have to take in order to rebrand themselves on a short or midterm basis is just something that's not feasible. Um, it would have to be a whole bunch of painting, reinvestment in beds and facilities and things that wouldn't have a return on investment within the next few months. It would be completely rebranding them in the long term and would have a huge investment in the short term. Um, Suze, I do think you do have some sort of, um, you, you probably could adapt yourselves a little bit, not as hostels, but maybe opening up bars without accommodation for Budapest or, you know, there is some sort of maybe short term business models that you could take on that's not hostels, but could maybe creatively, and we should talk about that, but some creative ideas that could still bring in some in income that would help you support to hibernate, as we said, and just wait until your crowd comes back and want the party hostels. So, yeah. Yeah, part of the things we're thinking about, it all depends on the local laws on when the bars can reopen, because two of the places do have courtyard bars. And we're talking about maybe turning the rooms into like an art gallery. And if there's a bunch of um, restaurants that cannot open because they're indoor only and they need an outdoor space, if they can maybe operate from our place and either pay half the rent or we would take some commission from every meal or something like that. But it's, again, it's very hard for us to go from backpacker crazy parties to being appealing to a local market. So that's another, that's something that we have to do. We have to just go, please come to our wonderful bar. It's open and that's all you need to know. And we'll definitely look after you and we love you. It's great, come. Yeah, some good ideas there, Suze, I like it. Anybody else that's, uh, I mean, we don't have to get too much into details about what people are doing because we're going to step into that soon. Um, but are, what's the feedback out there? Are people going to be adapting themselves? Is anybody hibernating? Is anybody closing down? Wanting to, yeah. Marco? You can unmute yourself first. 
Hostels, uh, in Barcelona and Roma. Uh, about my experience, what I can tell everybody, is some of you I meet in different uh, chat, so it's two months that we get crazy with million of webinar idea, what we can do long term, short term, maybe we can sell, we can refix. In the last week, I'm peaceful. I decide, and I want to that you transmit to everybody, that uh, you have to wait. Waiting. Don't take a decision. Because everything changing every day. Every day you get crazy. There is something new. Every, for example, in Spain, they opened a bar last uh, this week. Every bar was full. People doesn't follow any rule. Mere people inside the bar, uh, young people going out. What I mean that? That the, the only problem we have at the moment is uh, the uh, airplane, the restriction, and uh, this kind of thing. Because uh, probably people, if they can travel, they want to come back uh, more or less at the new reality, like how they call. So take a decision in this moment uh, is too strange because you don't know nothing. Your community European talk about uh, people can uh, travel each other uh, without stay 15 days because if they say 15 days, you have to waiting for in a country. Of course, we can close because nobody can come or you can stay inside. But uh, there is no million of idea. Generally, when I listen you, listen our colleague, uh, our association, everybody see the same. Okay, I can rent for long term. I can uh, change in hotel. I can do. But for me, the most important is waiting because probably maybe we are lucky in uh, August, September, start to change thing. For example, today we receive a reservation. One guest say, oh, thank you. I will come uh, to Rome in uh, October. In October, huh? So one week ago, nobody booked in uh, September, uh, July, whatever else. Now, be, because people are subject to what the government say. So we can talk about this, but for me, is uh, the best suggestion I can give to everybody is waiting. Just that. Sorry, yeah, yeah. I think, I, like I said, if you, if you can hi hibernate and just wait, um, but I think unfortunately, and just for curiosity, the bar that opened up and nobody cared in, in Spain, which city was that? I think it's Sevi Sevilla or Valencia, I'm not sure, I don't remember. Yeah, um, but the thing is, I mean, it's one thing as a bar, um, you know, and then you open and people don't care and they come, but I think hostels, like we've already talked about it, and I think people know, backpackers are the most resilient and um, hostels will probably be a, amongst the first to bounce back from this. But right now there's the restrictions and limitations of, your, of borders being closed. And for example, in Spain, the Spanish people that don't use hostels that think that um, they're dirty places or they're places for the homeless. Um, there's a perception change that needs to that needs to happen. And so, yeah, of course, uh, waiting and, and, and hoping that everything comes back as normal and as soon as possible is great. But we have limitations right now that some people cannot afford to do that until September, October. Um, and need to take action as soon as possible. So, I mean, I know I read something, I'm not sure how accurate this is because as we said everything changes every day but it seems like the EU will be opening up borders and uh, creating travel or trying to support travel within the EU I think it was as soon as June 15 if I'm not mixing June and July yeah the me. so June 15th now obviously tourism within Europe will not come back full force first uh, 15th of, of June. It's gonna come back with certain measures in place as well in the airlines or what have you. We'll have to wait and see. But in June 15th is not that much to wait. And maybe in June 15th, all the backpackers come back within Europe. Um, at least this is within Europe. Um, and we won't have too much to worry about. Meanwhile, um, the people I've been talking to within Europe, I think it's also good to be proactive, take the time that we have now to do something for June, July, August, just in case that that doesn't come back or there are too many, uh, too many restrictions. So, I mean, I've always said, like, don't put all your eggs in one basket. I remember having a conversation with a few that started talking about changing all their dorms into privates. And we see that the demand that's coming back and as little as it is, is coming back in dorms and it's coming back in the bigger dorms. 
So I wouldn't say don't do anything, but maybe instead of changing all the dorms into privates, maybe change a certain percentage of it, a quarter of your dorms into the privates, see how that's going. Is it filling up? Is it not? Are the dorms being filled up before you make a complete change and change everything? So I guess my message there is be proactive, and this is what this conversation is all about, be proactive about what changes can you make? How would you go about making them? And then make the decision at the appropriate time to trigger those actions and start acting on them, or at least, you know, at the very worst, you've thought about it, you've been proactive, you were ready, but then you didn't need it because everything came back June 15th, which would be amazing. Yeah, but sorry, there is a, a little uh, problem. Obviously, depends on the city where you are, okay? Mm -hmm. When we, I told you about the bar in Valencia, of course, everybody come there, but what's happening there? That uh, come uh, the government they say you close because nobody respect the sanity or I don't the healthy uh, system. So there is the risk at the moment because also the government they don't know the really rule you have to apply. So they say you have to do this, 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 and you uh, interpreted uh, what we say. So it's a gamble, okay? It's a it's something that is very strange. Of course, if you are uh, the only owner, you can rent a uh, long term is the best way, probably, guys, if you want survival without to spend money, uh, lose less money. But there is a lot of uh, variability, a lot of things that you have to consider. It. And you uh, have to consider that if there is some neighbor close to you, uh, see your guest that don't, doesn't respect, uh, call uh, the healthcare system, and uh, they come to you, you can close, and then you can have a problem. So you just, uh, just my suggestion, think about everything. This no means you have to do this, this or this. Every reality is different. Every hostel is different. Every economy or situation is different from everybody. But take care about what you do because you can pay then. Of course, I think any, any measures that we take or any adjustments we take to our business structure or the, the business plan, is going to have to take into consideration the government measures that they've set and that are regulations, of course. Sorry, Benita, you wanted to... No, uh, I wanted to say that um, as long as we don't have to make a lot of investment, of course, if we change strategy, we have to change our marketing and it costs money to change the marketing. But um, I think that that kind of investment you, we, might, we might do in order to get those long stays, in order to get students that come to the city to study, in order to get digital nomads, in order to get a lot of people that stay not, stay not only the seven days maximum limit or whatsoever, but they, I, 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 want, to, I want to bring those long stays uh, inside the hostel because this doesn't ask me for a big investment. I won't have to change rooms. I won't have to change anything. It's only the marketing cost that I, that I need. So, um, because like, like you said, Marco, um, making any kind of change, it, 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 uh, like that costs a lot of money, it's useless because you don't know what's going on. So this actually brings us to the to the next question, um, which is, uh, Leo, what are some business models a hostel could turn to during this time? Uh, right. So, I mean, hostels are probably most closely related to co-living spaces and student residents, uh, which could be more successful during these times. Um, I mean, one could also adapt their hostel to become a B&B &B or a hotel. And I know that there have been talks about doing that, creating more private rooms and private spaces. Um, but the thing is with that is that I think that B&Bs and hotels and creating this kind of business structure for yourself, um, you're entering brand new into a market that's already existing, already has the amount of offer it has in the market, which is probably oversaturated. And everybody's going to be fighting for, you know, the ho the hotel, the B and B guests. Um, so I think we all need to look within our market and see what the options are based on offer and demand. Because if we just enter in with a completely start from zero, I now a hotel for the next six months, um, 
might be might be positive, but it's it's a lot of work and a lot of time invested, and maybe even money invested in rebranding yourself in something that you may um, only need for a few months, and also the amount of reservations you would get as somebody that's coming in new to a saturated market. Personally, I don't know if that would have the biggest impact. So I. I really like more the idea of a co-living and student residence, which we, we've talked about with some people, um, and focusing towards those markets where, as Benedita said, you don't really need to make large investments and you don't really need to adapt much of what you're doing structurally. Um, and it also is very closely related to hostels, people that are looking for co-living, like the digital nomads and whatnot, and students looking for student housing, um, in a dorm style uh, is something that those are the kind of clients that we've always reached out to as a hostel and love the hostel concept and the atmosphere need the common kitchens so it's definitely something that we're more suitable to adapt ourselves to in a shorter midterm without making large investments um, so I think that would be my advice about some some possibilities about different business uh, models as Sue said, maybe there's other business models that would fit your particular case. Um, you know, uh, whether it's opening up a barbershop, <laughs> uh, but whatever it is, uh, there are business models out there that might work well with the facilities that you already have um, in order to capture some income now without doing, or not without not doing anything and just waiting for the the, um, the hostel market to come back. I see Sergey uh, has his hand raised. Sergey, if you want yeah, to, yeah. do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hello, guys. Uh, you right now you're talking about few months, you know, of um, empty your kind of uh, thing. But please think about one more um, uh, idea to consider. Uh, it could be second wave of coronavirus this autumn and this winter. So if you will wait this month and expect to be working at the, the at autumn time, but if the second wave will come, you will be in a trouble. So we should think about the possibility of second wave and make plans for, you know, whole year of uh, this bad season. Uh, I'm finished. Okay, by the way, which, which hostel are you from? Can you introduce it's yourself? It's South Kitchen in St. Petersburg. And but think about uh, Russia, for example, that we have really uh, like high season in spring and in summer, but in the winter it's dead season anyway. So even if we will like if we will not catch this high season and not earn any money in a low season, we'll be in, in big trouble actually. So that's why we are thinking, uh, me and Luba and Oksana, we are thinking about co-living space for long term. Mm. So, I mean, about the, the second wave, uh, yeah, we don't know if that's going to happen. I think every country is in its own situation. In Spain, it's a hot topic because uh, I'm in Spain. I think people know that. But um, it's a hot topic because people, the government's just starting to release people <laughs> um, in phases. And we don't know yet if there's going to be a second wave, how strong it's going to be. Personally, I, I think it won't be as bad as it first was, I think it's going to be controlled. Um, and even though Spanish people kind of like to disregard or the vast majority like to disregard the government's advice and, you know, just go out there and create parties anyways. Uh, I think last weekend we had 400 parties crashed in Madrid by the police. Um, but the second wave could happen. But at least in the case of uh, Spain, which I can speak on their behalf because I'm here, um, it, it's the, the government's helping with, you know, like letting people off layoffs in a staged way so that it's not right away back to business as usual. And if we see a second wave hitting, then the state of alarm won't be lifted or will be called on again. And we'll be back to where we are right now with maybe being forced to close or not. But that doesn't really stop us from, you know, as we're doing, thinking of what to do to adapt to the situation. And then take it as it comes. And if we hit a second wave, then we'll have to adapt to that as well, or we'll be forced to, i.e. shutting down. Um, but very good point to think about a second wave as we're going through this, and also take that into consideration when, when creating the new business plan for the next few few months. And Leo, one more thing, sorry. 
Yeah. Uh, it could be not just second wave of the same coronavirus. It could be mutation of this coronavirus. So it's going to be kind of a totally new virus. And they're going to, you know, fight with that from the very beginning as well. So it could be, you know, this totally the same situation, not lighter, but the same. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, let's, let's think about what we're going to do next um, but with, not, with, with no thought of a second coronavirus come. And if it comes, we'll have to deal with it. But let's work with the thought that it's not coming. Marina, I think you raised your hand, yeah? Do you hear me? Yeah, good. Uh, I don't know if many of you know me. I'm from Sao Paulo, Brazil. One of um, Ojikada hostels, a small hostel. And we are, like you, kind of desperate on what we're going to do with our hostel, with our structure, with our costs and everything. And what I believe uh, is that whatever we do until we have a passing, passing right? It, it won't be hostels. It will be something else. Like we will be having co-living, co we'll have a barber shop, we'll have something else to somehow make money with our structure to hibernate in the way of losing less money. And we'll be making wholesales when this is over. And, and that's kind of desperating because we don't know when this will be over. And I think unless we have a vaccine, there will be no shared rooms for anyone. There will be no possibility of us having five people sleeping in the same room and like not providing experience not providing connections will be hard like sitting is very hard so uh, yeah i think what we have to think is like how we're gonna renew as a whole so when we, like are we gonna last all that long like are we lasting two years five years whatever it takes and if we last what we're gonna do to last <laughs> because this is this is kind of what intrigues me, what is, what is taking my sleep. <laughs> yeah, and I think every country, the, the bounce back time in every country is going to be different. But what people are looking at and forecasting is that, well, a, a full comeback won't happen until a year from now. Yes. Uh, but, but I don't think we need to focus on the full comeback. I think if we come back even 50, 75 percent, then people will be able, most people, not everybody, because people are going to disagree with me, but uh, most people, I think, will be able to maintain their hostel, at least with cutting back on expenses and things like that. So I don't think we need to gloom ourselves with, we have to wait a full year before we're back to normal. Um, personally, I think, and it kind of depends on the market, that the, the real tough time is going to be the next six months. Um, and after those six months, Again, depends on your market because also in the next six months we'll be in winter or low season for some people, so it might extend to a year for them. But in general, I think in the next six months things will go back to semi-normal, hopefully, uh, in most markets. Lorenzo, I see your hand up. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So. Uh... Uh, I first thing first uh, I just two or three days ago I just saw the adopt a hostel in in the national television with Benedita okay she spoke about it and in my opinion well it might be very interesting uh, but then let's see because I just spoke with my manager today for example and Actually, he just told me, uh, don't send any group proposals at this moment uh, before speaking with me, okay? Basically, what's going on is uh, maybe this is going to be six tough months, as Lear was saying, okay? But then it does come the, high, the low season, so uh we do have like 10 employees we do pay a big rent we do pay electricity and all those bills and actually i'm quite sure that there are 
there will be a lot of a lot of businesses uh, falling down and I am actually not sure if my business which is not so small uh, it's not going to be one of them well Lorenzo um, sorry to hear that <laughs> uh, I think that's why this is really important uh, call to have because focusing on long-term stays, for example, which we're going to touch more base on, but maybe this is why it's really important to think about the business model to last, whether it's the year that you need to last and focusing on uh, whether it's the students, the co-living or whatever business model is good for your hostel during this time in order to survive a year if you need to, or forever, maybe, maybe some people will have to change their business model for good. Um, that depends on their case. So maybe for you, it would be good to have um, a hotel or to adapt yourself to a hotel or B&B or to adapt yourself to co-living or student residency, something that will get you through the, the, the low season that's going to be approaching once this kind of gets back to normal. Either that or uh, unfortunately, some will have to take the decision of maybe selling now while there's still the possibility to send before you go bankrupt. Um, obviously selling now is not ideal because the, the asking price will have to be much lower than the, the worth of the hostel back in its days because there's a big risk involved in taking over a hostel right now. But it might be the only way for some people, um, unfortunately, because if they cannot make it through this by adapting themselves, um, I mean, if you're just going to wait for your hostel to go bankrupt and then get nothing for it, there, there still is the option of selling and i know that there's a lot of investment companies out there that right now are willing to make that risk and buy um and so it's it's an option that some people are gonna have to take thanks Renzo. you're welcome i think also drawer wanted to say something yeah by the way everybody uh, i was going to to write this message on the chat I want to remind you guys, there is a raise hand option. To see it, you need to open up the participant list. So in the bar below, you'll see a button called participants. You'll, it'll open up a list on your, on your uh, right side. And on the bottom of the list, you have a button saying raise hand, okay? So whenever you want to jump in, just click on that. We'll see like a small blue hand next to your name. So we, it'll signal to us that you want to join the call and participate, okay guys? So go ahead, Dror. Um, just for like the idea of looking at student residents, I think that one of the maybe only industries that have been like in tourism or hospitality that's getting hit stronger than us is probably student residents. As um, they went down to zero like a few months ago and um, like first enough universities are talking already about not opening for like the fall semester which would be, I think, starting around October. Anyway, for us, it means like getting students, if at all, it's just from October and on. But then when you look at that, it's like, um, it's another, would be another competitive with over uh, a lot of offer on the market, very little demand. And with universities going digital already for the last couple of months, I think a lot of them will try to continue that. And I think it's even more relevant in um, Europe where a lot of the universities are public universities and for like the risk for the government with the universities of getting like centers of coronavirus in the universities is probably a lot uh, more worrying. So I think like if somebody's thinking of student residents need to think about all those things before they're doing any changes towards that. Awesome. So I see Marco has his hand raised. Don't forget to unmute yourself first. Sorry? Okay. No, uh, there is one point that I would like to talk with everybody that is interesting. Today we started to check the cost uh, of uh, adapt to the um, coronavirus uh, virus um, protocol. Okay? So I calculated more or less how much can cost uh, for, uh, for us. We see that uh, depend how you want to work, uh, you have to invest two, three thousand, four thousand, five thousand, depend of uh, material. And uh, there is a cost of uh, 700, 500 uh, euro months only for mask, gel, uh, whatever else. This is something nobody thinks about uh, a lot at the moment. Uh, so uh, one thing I want to propose to all my colleagues, um, 
I think we have to make some kind of tax or something that the guests have to pay. And therefore, this is important that everybody are together. Because if we start to uh, um, destroy the, with the price, okay, sell very, very low, very low. If you sell low and have to pay all this, you can close. So it's very important that we can try to find some way to make pay the guests to come for some safe. But this is not something only for me. It has to be that if you come in my hostel, then go to Lisbon or go in another city, maybe you can find that too. If we work in this way, there is a possibility to uh, live better because the cost, if you work well, are higher, more than you can imagine. Because if you give a mask, your, only for your employer, five masks for 30 days is a very big cost. The gel, if people use the gel, is a six euro, seven euro, one, bo one of these. So you have to calculate this. So this is one idea that I want to launch for everybody because I'm agree with uh, uh, Sergey, he will come back probably. This is the new reality, the virus like IgG, other virus don't uh, disappear uh, so but we can live with the, with them so we have to adapt at this so just uh, this idea for everybody i want to say this idea sorry Benedita, go ahead don't forget to unmute well we have we we, uh, we discussed in our hostels association here in portugal to get all together and try to buy all these masks and gel and so all together so that we can lower the price um, and we can find much lower prices if 50 60 hostels buy those materials together then if each one does it by themselves yeah I, that's great and that kind of ties in a lot with the last week's talk about the importance of creating a network of hostels um i just want to kind of veer this away from protective measures because i really think that I, we are we, we we've tried talking about that it's a very difficult subject and it's very important but for every country and every market it's different what's imposed on you what's not imposed on you but can help you certificates uh, things like that. It also goes really into the concept of revenue management, which can be its own discussion. I definitely do agree with Marco, and um, you should avoid at all cost a price war. We are going to be talking about some sales strategy for the new uh, business concept that you may create and how to do that. And the focus is going to be always on not lowering the price. Um, and it's not just because of the added expenses that you're going to have in these protective measures that you're putting into place. But it's also because it, as soon as you lower down the ADR in the market, the price, then it's very difficult to get it back up. So it's about including new services or giving add-ons instead of reducing the price, making people choose you because you're doing certain things, for example, like the protective measures and you're offering security and there's a cost to that. I will say just out of uh, curiosity for people that I did go to the hairdressers as soon as they opened as soon as the barber shop was open that was the first one with the with um with an appointment and they did tell me that to come in i had to have a mask and they said you can get one at the pharmacy next door if they don't have any we can sell it to you at the same price and it's going to be one euro so keep that in mind that you may be able to depends on i guess the regulations of your country and what you're willing to do whether you want to include it in the price or not but um i do suggest offering um face masks to people that are at the hostel but you can also include that in the cost or charge them for it at cost if you're unless your country says you must provide it within the cost it's something that you might be able to to charge for. Gustavo, you've had your hand up, um, so go ahead. Hey guys, uh, I'm Gustavo from uh, Queen Hostel Milan, and I would like to add something about the um, changing the business model. So um, here in our hostel, we have the regular dorms. We don't have privates. Uh, we are closed since uh, March 12th. 
uh, and just start to arrive some uh, bookings, group bookings. Uh, we, we sent two uh, proposals last week for a group in August and a group in October. Also, another thing that starts to, to work again is the word packers uh, requests. So before we haven't seen any volunteer uh, asking for a stay with us. And uh, just this week, we had like six volunteers uh, requesting to come volunteer with us. Uh, another interesting thing is that uh, on the same building of the hostel, we have 40 rooms in shared apartments that we rent for international students. It's a separately, it's, it's kind of separate business, uh, but it's managed kind of together. Um, and from all the 40 rooms, uh, 36 of them, they left for their countries. Uh, but we, we already received like 15 requests for September. So uh, we can see through this that uh, maybe a student house can be something uh, to change during this period. Uh, we don't know if we will be allowed to receive those students and to receive those guests, but uh, at least they have interest in coming to Milan. Uh, I also came back to Milan this week. I arrived on Monday. I was in Brazil. And uh, there are some flights coming to Europe. Uh, and it was kind of uh, not good, but uh, not, let's say, dark atmosphere on the airports and on the flights. So we're still hibernating. We don't know when we're going to open yet, but uh, we are checking all those possibilities. And also for the co-living, we were looking for some uh, demand, but we couldn't find. We, we see that it's maybe, in our case, easier to find through the student house. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks. So, uh, Lorenzo? No? <laughs> All right. So, um, next question is, so, Leo, uh, it's a bit obvious but we'll, you'll, I'm sure you'll still you'll have more to talk about this but what's the target audience that we should focus on? Uh, yeah it's a good one um, and we have kind of touched on it so I mean the the target audience for student housing is obviously students. Um, Co-living is also students, uh, students with, with uh, reduced costs and digital nomads. I don't think we've really touched on the digital nomads yet, but um, co-living would really be good for that. Uh, now, if it's a hotel or B&B adapting to private rooms, uh, which could also be done at the same time, the I guess the, the target audience for that, you really need to start focusing at, in the short mid midterm on local tourism. So the, um, the travelers within your own country, uh, here in Spain, for example, um, at first people are not allowed to travel within uh, across regions, but they can stay within the region. So that will be the first uh, tourism that hopefully comes back. And then once the borders open within the regions of the country, then it's going to be local tourism or national tourism. And so there could be a, a good focus for some people in families. So converting maybe dorms into uh, a family, a private room, whether it's a family room, if there's a double bed or creating like friends and family room for, you know, like if you have a six dorm room, it could fit up to six people, obviously, but using it for private use, uh, that could be listed as a six private room with, you could either have the same price for the room, no matter what the occupancy is from three to six people, or you can have a price per occupancy. So you can say the price for the room is, uh, let's just put a figure on there, 50 euros, and then it's 10 euros more for each occupant up to six people. Airbnb would be a really good place for this, but uh, you know, even booking.com, maybe your own DMS has a way of doing that. Uh, but this would be one of the target audience that could be a very good potential for many people right now. The families and the group of friends, I can still see that, for example, in local travel, there's going to be a group of friends. I've even talked about it with my friends. We said, as soon as we're able to go out, let's get to know our own country that we're in and travel out there. So, you know, a group of four or six people that are going to be looking for a place, 
a hostel with private accommodation is a perfect uh, choice for that. So that would be a good target audience. Awesome. I see Medina has her hand raised. Don't forget to unmute. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Sorry, I'm still learning. Uh, yeah, I'm still curious about the, the co-living concept because we've been through some, some calculations here and it's not really, doesn't pay our bills. Like we've been selling like rooms for imagine 300 monies and then we start selling a room for five times, like for five days of, of stay would be the monthly fee for, uh, for a co-living project. So like that would cost, like we would have much less income. I know we would have much less outcome as well, but that kind of makes us, our business is still run on, oh, I don't know the words in English, <laughs> those financial words, but like I will have less receipts than I need to run my business. So that's kind of, uh, okay, just can solve. Uh, I heard someday, I don't know if you're all famili familiarized with Uber, you probably are, but I heard it's like having a Ferrari to run a Uber. You do get some cash from it, but you don't, you don't pay your Ferrari at the end. You have a much bigger structure. You have a much bigger like rooms. You have lots of fun areas. You have swimming pools. You have stuff. And then you just have this very small income. And that doesn't really pay your bills. So like how long can we last being Ubers? <laughs> Every other solution is going to be like making us become Ubers with a super nice structure. So I'm still not very confident on transforming our hostels into a student house because that's gonna cost us money because we have to transform our private rooms made for people to stay two, three, four days into like houses where people have have wardrobes and TVs and stuff like this. I was hearing from the Budapest party hostels. That's not gonna so like how how would they do that? So I think we're still in a very complicated situation and it can bring us some money in some cash flow but that's that's not a solution we are we are really in a bad in a bad position right now so so marina i just yeah. like i would just like you to think that uh co-living can be just as a hustle like i don't think you need to adapt anything and make your you don't have to take your six dorm room knock it down put in a double bed and um you know like a cupboard a cupboard a wardrobe um, I don't think you need to go into much investment. Co-living can be as easy as a hostel with a long-term stay in maybe more comfortable uh, situations. So it could be maybe two people in the room instead of six. Now, of course, that's not ideal. We want to fill our six-bed dorm with six backpackers 30 days of the month. Um, that would be the ideal. The thing is that it's, it's not realistic right now for many people. If it is something that you can do, then you don't need to adapt yourself. Um, yes. Also, yeah. And also, as I said, don't put all your eggs in one basket, meaning that it doesn't mean that all your rooms need to convert to these long-term uh, stays and this co-living. You can take a certain percentage of the rooms dedicated to long-term living that would have gone unused anyways, and it's just added income. And like you said, there's less expense because it, the more long terms you have, uh, long term stays, the less reception hours you might need for check in, the less cleaners you might need for for cleaning the rooms. So there's definitely um, it, it's definitely something that should be looked into to supplement, but not to just completely turn. Well, it depends on your case, but it's not about. I'm not saying completely turn yourself into co-living with only private rooms for the next year. It's not necessarily that, but maybe having some sort of co-living for the next month, two, three months, depending on your case, with as much as you can fill up while still having some dorms for the backpackers, having some dorms that you can use for the family or friends that are coming in to use the private rooms. It's about this kind of juggling act and trying to put your eggs in different baskets to try to get as much income as you can while supporting the outcome. Um, and Benita, sorry, you've had your hand up. Okay, the, I just wanted to say that we are not going to make any profit until summer next year. It's no, no way to think of. And I think that we have to, to, to make some 
some sums and see uh, what we are what expenses we are going to increase having those people inside the hostel uh, from how many it, is it worth to compensate and to get some amount of money because going out of red no way to go before it will come out i'm sure and Pamela. <laughs> Hi everyone, Pam from Swinky Croatia. Is it too loud? If it's too loud, I don't want to speak. Hey, we can hear you. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, I maybe just have a question for general, for everyone. Um, so students for us won't probably work because everybody's doing online schooling since like the lockdown in three days, whole Croatia went in uh, online studying students are done in june and july anyway so like that wouldn't do much maybe for a day or two if they need to travel now they are allowing us to travel between cities and everything um long-term stays always but like still not many people only like people asking to volunteer or people who got stuck already in zagreb who couldn't travel home had canceled flights and stuff um but what we are thinking like legit what else we can do besides earning money from accommodation like sue said maybe i don't know put an art gallery or something i'm li literally interested has anyone thought of like a side business like we sell a tour like we sell a backpack or a mug or a beer has anybody thought of any extra creative ways like creating maybe online content, pay two euros, join, blah, whatever. Um, literally anything like in that sense, because I think accommodation right now, we're kind of like, it is there. Whoever wants to come, we have space, but we're trying to not be 100% concentrated on that because for a few months it's not going to work. We are still completely empty for May and June. All of them canceled maybe first ones are like august and september but that's like nothing that's like people saying three days it's not enough to hibernate for the six months because we're already doing it for almost two so i would be interested to hear any possible idea there's no stupid idea just like a little brainstorm thank you um so Pema, yeah i do see some people with their hands up to answer that and i think it's really great to talk about i just want to make sure that um talking about students that it's like you said, like you have these rooms and any accommodation that you can get, you take it. So I think that's really important. And I want you to keep into consideration that students can really still be a, a big um, audience for you. One, the students that are already in Croatia that are doing their own quarantine, wherever it is that they're doing it, when they get out of there, they might not flee right away to go back home or they might not have already fleed. Um, it's about reaching out to them, creating these kind of discounts. And I think we have on the list as well to talk about sales strategies and how to market and get, to, get out to this audience. But think also of the people that will be coming back next September, hopefully, uh, because they already are enrolled and they're going to be studying. And many of them, I, I speak from experience in working in hostels in Madrid um, and in other places where a lot of the students come a month before to kind of settle in, find apartments, I know I've worked in many hostels that people, that students, like S September or August is a big month for us with students because they come in and they start looking for their accommodation and they keep extending day by day. And some of them end up being there for weeks or months at a time while they're looking for accommodation long term. If you were to capture on them, one, if you let them know before they even come to the country while they're looking for accommodation, if you reach out to them and tell them like, we have something for you, we have this opportunity, uh, you have social, social life here, you have a kitchen, you have this, you have that, and you create this package for them um, and this experience and you reach out to them, I think you'll find you'll have a lot of demand from students that are willing to come to you at least for a month with a certain discount while they're looking for a longer term accommodation. So I really think there's still that audience for you for the summer and for, for September. 
but I'll get back to your question about extra income that can be made during this time. And I think Benedita was adamant to answer that one. Well, um, as some of you probably know, I have a wonderful big kitchen inside the hostel that is completely closed. So I found um, a young girl who is a cook, a cook and who is in, uh, you know, with problems with space at home. She has a lot of people asking her to cook for them. And so I suggested her to come and cook inside the um, in Amal Hostel, where she has large fridges and freezers and place to cook a lot of a lot of cooking at the same time. And she will start, she's, we, we are starting with creating menus and creating and photographing and creating social media and everything. And she will start she next week to cook in a larger scale um, in, in, in the hostel. And she will pay me a rent for using the kitchen and probably as the business will grow, grow because she will cook for a very special mark, market like gluten free market we will probably uh, increase the business and make something out of it so um, from next week on someone is going to cook every day inside the hostel and let's see how it goes Very good. Uh, I'd like to hear from Cash. He's had his hand up. I don't know if that's to do with uh, what we're asking. Hi, guys. Uh, sorry I was late, but I, I just wanted to drop in. Um, uh, first thing, I just wanted to, in case uh, somebody had mentioned in response to Pam from Swanky Mint, in terms of products and ideas, I don't know if you guys follow the yard in Bangkok, and uh, it's a great hostel, and they've been recently. Um, making lots of um, fresh fruit smoothies and products and home baked bread, which they were planning to offer anyway in their breakfast service. And they've been going on a little sh sh kind of cart, uh, Bangkok style, going around their neighborhood and selling their products. And it's been A, bringing them some money, but it's also been also great for them to promote their brand to their kind of local uh, neighborhood and make them aware that they exist in the neighborhood. So I think that's a smart idea because uh, sometimes when you have a great memory of a hostel, you want to buy something that reminds you of the hostel. Um, but it's just saying this is not allowed in Lisbon. Uh, it's a shame. Uh, but if, if it is possible in your city, then, uh, then that would be nice. It's in, just to offer to your guests. And the second thing I wanted to mention, which might have been mentioned before in the thing, is that I, I spend a lot of time traveling around, staying in apartments, hostels, and uh, I've stayed at a few co-living spaces in Asia. And the way they make money is not only just on the accommodation, but they upsell on, on, on food and drink. So they offer breakfast, lunch, dinner packages. Uh, so they offer the whole package. And that's where they also make a lot of money. So if it is possible for you to offer and cook for your guests in your hostel, then that's one way I think you guys could make maybe a little bit more money to, uh, to compensate for the rates in the room. That's what I want to say. Thank you very much, Cash. We're actually going to exactly um, touch on that as well. We're talking about like um, pricing and strategies. And I think that's perfect uh, that you brought it up. Students and in, in students and digital nomads, I think they're going to be looking for uh, convenience and we do have kitchens and a lot of us offer breakfast lunch dinner um, and it is there is an opportunity there to, to gain some more money so thank you very much cash and Lorenzo you had your hand up as well uh, yeah so uh, basically uh, one of the this is all very very pretty like uh, let's do the student house and all of that it's not just me lorenzo's cracking right okay uh lorenzo you're really cracking up oh, your yeah now you're good yeah. now you're good Go for it. okay uh and i was just saying that in some businesses maybe and like you'll have uh, 
Sorry? You're cracking again. <laughs> uh, yes, no. So far, so good now. Okay. In some businesses, it's just a way for us to don't lose that much money. Okay. So uh, it's, it's difficult to get a break even. Uh, so uh, let's see how it goes. And then actually, uh, you have to work on your Wi-Fi. <laughs> Sorry, Lorenzo, I had to mute you because you just keep going in and out. I think the only thing I caught was um, it's going to be hard to break even. Um, and yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, that is the case. It's going to be very hard to break even, but I think breaking even is better than having a complete loss for a year. So trying to break even for the next year um, will be, I think, a great goal. <laughs> uh, but also keeping in mind, of course, and we're all we're, we're talking about this, and we're all doing it, but keeping in mind as well costs that can be cut in order to help so that you do break even or make some sort of profit. So um, trying to cut the cost as well as trying to build in as much income as possible. Uh, I don't see anyone with their hands up right now. So Beatrice, I'll let you continue. Yeah, so for the next one, um, so we talked about what target audience to, to focus on. And so what are the, what sales strategies uh, should be created for, these, for this new target audience? Um, so pricing strategies, uh, first of all, again, I, I think I need to touch on the fact that it's really important not to enter into a price war. Uh, so the backpacker international traveler is not coming back anytime soon for most of us. Uh, so just cutting down costs as much as possible in order to get be lower than the competitor. Um, we've talked about in previous chats. Um, it's just, it's not going to be useful. So. First of all, making uh, services and packages that are effective for or that are useful to this new segment uh, and that people are looking for. But then you can also offer discounts to the people that you're looking to market to. So let's say you're marketing to students. Obviously, making a student discount would be good. And it's also a good way to capture on the local market because maybe it's not a student that's coming into your country to study or that's in your country studying. It might be a student within your country, you know, a local student that you're attracting with a discount. Um, you can make discounts for long term stays, obviously. We've talked about that. So if you're trying to cap uh, capture, um, digital nomads, for example, in a co-living kind of situation, the long-term stay discounts, or maybe a long-term package. It doesn't necessarily have to be a discount. It could be a flat rate. So when you do your math and you say, okay, well, I could do with giving away this room for X amount of euros per month, uh, include dinner and whatnot, and at least that will give me some sort of it safe income while I try to sell the other rooms to friends and families, to groups of friends. So different discounts and different packages, I think are really important instead of just cutting down your cost and saying, okay, well, this is my new rate. No, it's create, stay as much as you can with your rate and create these discounts and packages and add-ons for the market that you're trying to attract and market to them and reach out to them. So this is where I think we, we hate to spend money now, but targeted AdWords, uh, targeted social media marketing done the right way will definitely get you a return on investment once you've created this package, this business model, once you know what you've, what you've made, who you want to target it to, um, what price it's gonna cost them, and then send it out to them so that they see it. You need to have visibility. So. Um, you know, just a very easy example is if you're reaching out to the local travelers, right, the group of friends, for example, that are going to come party in Budapest. Uh, so maybe the Hungarians that are coming into Budapest and also want to party for a weekend or have their bachelor party that they were supposed to have. Uh, you can easily in social media, you can target people that are in the country 
and say like, okay, I want to target students, but I don't want to target students from all over the world because that's going to get too expensive. I'm just going to target students that are already in my country. Um, I know we have Stephen Knight with us today, so I don't know if they would like to kind of talk about how to target to um, any new market that we're creating. Um, but marketing and keeping a very good price point for them are going to be ideal in order to capture this audience and bring them into your hostel. Yeah, we have uh, Marco here uh, asking, um, but do, do we have many people for long-term stays? Do we have many people for long-term stays? And if these are good guests are problematic. Do we have many people? But what do you mean do we have many people for long-term stays? Um, Marco, if you want to unmute yourself and... I, I, if we can actually, I see Charlotte has her hand up. So as we're talking about marketing, I, I'd like to go with Charlotte and then Marco's already saying, no, 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 he doesn't want to talk. So <laughs> later. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Um, so I mean, it's a big topic, so I can't, I won't go on and on. Um, I think it's before immediately going right here, domestic market, let's let's target them but them it's it's very it's still a very broad term um so in t in terms of looking at how you i'm trying to i'm trying to trying to summarize it in like a small little thing but as in before you pay any money for targeted ads on social google you need to really sit down and think about who within your domestic market you're targeting because it's still a very very big audience um and it's still, there's, there are still a lot of, of areas within your country that, that they won't stay with you or they won't want to stay with you or they can't um so i think it's really about sitting down and put, putting together a separate domestic market strategy going through who you who you think you who you think your services, your facilities, you would, they would want. And then going from there, there's no point in spending any money. I mean, Facebook will take it, but as in, it's not, there's going to be no return on investment in just, just kind of going out there without any kind of plan. Um, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to think about how to say it kind of succinctly, but I think really it's, it's about it's it's about creating a, a staycation kind of thing a domestic market strategy that still works for your brand but you di you're diversifying so i would say speak to somebody um either within your own network within your own team uh, before paying any money um for ads um yeah um, thanks, Charlotte. I, I'll also you, um, also mention stay the night would be a great place to start for you to, um, if you're thinking about marketing. And I do think that marketing is really important right now. So reaching out to the girls at stay the night to create that plan that Charlotte was talking about. It's true that, I mean, that's what we're talking about. This, this whole hour and a bit has been about that. Um, we've been all over the place, but each one kind of has to decide in which direction they want to go, what they want to do with their business structure on a short and midterm and then you need to market for that you can't just say like okay i'm going to focus on students for the next six months or i'm going to focus on digital nomads and then just like create a discount in your mind and put it up on your website you know it, it needs to go beyond that so you need to create a strategy i think as charlotte was was saying and then you need to create a plan for that and market it properly not just give money to uh, to Google and social just to, to, to give them money. So I would suggest um, marketing would be a good area to focus on and stay then it would be a great idea to, to get some, some help with that. Tatiana, you have your hand up. Hi guys. Hey Tatiana. Hi, finally here. So, it's great to see that I know most of you guys. I'm very happy with that. <laughs> so um, I was thinking about something. Um, I'm hearing all of this conversation. Where are the guests? What can we do about our place and everything? And I'm sorry, I'm not the owner of a hostel. 
uh, I work with Benedita in the Good Morning Hostel. But um, actually, uh, for the, um, the past um, month, I've been very updated with, uh, with all the social media. And I'm trying to be as close as I can with all of the guests that we have and all of the ones that can come in the future. And one of the things that I realized is that at least in our market, people are not afraid of traveling. The main problem is that they cannot travel. <laughs> so um, I don't feel that we're going to have problems in having people with us. We're going to have problems, first of all, of getting them here and afterwards to know how the government is going to, to work with all of the rules of safety and hygiene. Those are the things that we still don't know and that's why we cannot open because we don't know how it's going to be. Um, because of course that we always want to take care of our guests, but first of all, we want to take care of our staff, right? And, and the staff can do everything about the hostel, everything in the hostel, according to the limits that the government gives us. So, um, today I was talking with several digital nomads that we have, asking me when are we able to open. Uh, actually, I told them, okay, we, I can open for you if you stay with us at least a month, and I need 15 of you, <laughs> okay? So, at least through these conversations, I realized that they want to come. They still don't know how to, and they don't feel comfortable because they don't know how we're going to work with that. So those are the first things. And of course, that we are thinking about the ones that can travel to us. That is the second part of our duty now. I think that first of all, we need to work with what and who we have now here. That in our case, we are in Lisbon, we've got to think about Portuguese. We cannot think about the ones that will travel here. We've got to think about all the facilities that the hostel has. How can we open? What can we do? We have a lovely kitchen. We have several bathrooms. <laughs> uh, we have a, a, a small, tiny, but a nice bar. And, and we have people that still want to work. And if Portuguese want to come, even if they are students, even if they want to make a party, even if that works for us in terms of earning money, it works for them. I think that nowadays we are thinking about, uh, we have a disease happening, we've got to adjust ourselves, we've got to work with that, we've got to, to live with that because it won't disappear that soon. So if we need to work with a mask, we're going to work with a mask. Um, but, but first of all, let's try to do the best we can for the place that we have. Now, let's not think about selling the business and selling for what? Everyone is going to sell now. Everything is going to be so cheap now, Lorenz. So selling for less than you buy that? I don't think it works then. So let's think about the students. Where are the students? What can we do with them? Do they want to make a party? At least here in Portugal, we still have the police trying to make everyone go away from the parties. So they're not afraid of being together, but maybe the staff is going to be afraid of being with them. <laughs> so after the rules come, let's try to think about it again. Sorry, Thanks, I talked too much. Thanks, Tatiana. As Cash said, I think we all want to go to Lisbon right now and stay at Good Morning Hostel <laughs> and have some breakfast waffles made with love. Um, Charlie, you have your hand up. Hello, back again. Yeah, I think it's, it's a really important point that actually a lot of people haven't changed. It, the situations change, the world change, but a lot of people still want to travel. And the the value of, of kind of marketing off, investing your time in, especially looking at the domestic market, sorry, my what's what's going on, um, is that whilst people have changed and th their options have actually got smaller, so there's a massive, massive opportunity for, for, for you to sell in that market. Um, and whilst 
a domestic market might not have been lucrative for you in the past. People haven't got the whole world to choose from. They've only got a few different areas. So it's still worth, that's why it's so worth maintaining your marketing and investing in both time and maybe money in the future in it. Awesome, thank you so much, Charlotte. So let's move on to the next one, still in, um, in the marketing part. So Leah, how, sh how should the new business model be marketed online? So should there be a new website, a new OTA listing using new OTAs? Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I think we've talked about marketing. Um, it, this question was first kind of brought up because the webinar that I attended and some talks that I've heard of people is that if they were going to completely reinvent themselves, um, you know, for example, open up as a hotel, uh, they didn't want to dilute their current brand and say, okay, we're now a hotel, you know, so the, there was talks about people creating new websites, creating AdWords um, or um, investing in AdWords for a new, a new brand. They were going to rebrand themselves or they are, a few are going to rebrand themselves for the short term to try to kind of over, like last these next six months as a hotel or a B and B. And of course, if you're going to change your, if you're going to completely change your business model and not be a hostel anymore, then yeah, you probably would need a new website, a new social media uh, profile and everything like that. You'll you'd need a new OTA profile um, because people will need to know what to expect when they come to you um, and then review you accordingly to what their expectations were. Um, hopefully I don't, um, we don't get to that point that people like can completely need to rebrand themselves, reimage themselves for the long term, and that's why I kind of wanted to focus a little bit more about co-living and student situations, so that we're not completely reinventing them ourselves. Um, one thing we do want to, we should touch upon is your your reviews or your online reputation as you open up in a new situation in the COVID nineteen situation. Um, you might not live up to what your hostel was before. So, I mean, like Good Morning Hostel, for example, that's here with us, um, Luba from, or Sergey as well, uh, from Soul Kitchen in St. Petersburg, one of the best hostels in the world with 90, 98, 99% ratings. Now we're gonna open up with less atmosphere, with less people, um, you know, really have to struggle to try to give the same amount of the same service with the measures that they we have to put into place with less expenses so possibly less staff because we have less customers so the situation for them is completely different and i think one thing that really need, you need to take into consideration is when you reopen up your sales online and you're able to get the the backpackers back when you have the students in there when you have the digital nomads it may very well affect your rating. And so the next, over the next two, three months, when you're not able to give that 98, 99% um, uh, quality, how's that gonna affect your reviews in the long term? so that once the backpacking starts coming back, you're still at the 98, 99%. So it's something that we're definitely kind of discussing and struggling and, and thinking of ideas of what can be done. And so, it is one benefit to if you if you create a completely different business structure, um, if you do have a different online profile, if you have a different marketing, that you're marketing yourself as something temporarily while maintaining on hold your current business or your your core business of being a hostel and, and doing it the way you've always done it. So it is just something to take into consideration and try to take some actions as to when I come back. How do I not come back in a way that will affect my online reputation and then will affect me in the long term? I think that's something that's very important to, to think about and to discuss. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone wants to kind of discuss about that or anything that they're taking into account as they're reopening of how it may affect their online reputation what they can do about that to not have a lasting negative impact on online reputation. It's kind of a hard subject. We, 
Benedita. Yeah, well, what if, if with long stays, we can always create a real relationship with them and then have an open talk with them about concerning the subject. But with short stays where we can't give them the hugs that Tatiana used to give, we can kind of like what wrong now, we always uh, surround the guest with, the, with his arms, we cannot get uh, with our scrambled eggs or waffles on and, and reach to them when they are sitting on the table and ask them, do you want some more? All this very, very personal interaction is impossible with social distance. And with long space, we can always talk to them and discuss the subject openly with them. But if other guests come just for two or three days, as usually they come, it is impossible because this is not a subject that we can, we can um, talk to them. And so I don't know how it is going, to, how, how to solve this problem. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I will say that I've, I've reached out already and just asked this question to, to Hustle World. They recently had a webinar and I've reached out and asked them, but I think we still need to talk about it more in depth to see if there's something that can be, or what they can think of. Um, I see Hustle World's with us. I'm just not sure who exactly it is from Hustle World and, and, and don't want to surprise them with the trick question. But um, I think we definitely should reach out to the OTAs or think to ourselves what we can do to not have a negative impact on our online reputation and reviews. So if it's a possibility to kind of, you know, rebrand ourselves on the channels, at least temporarily, so that that kind of takes the, uh, that reflects the current situation, the reviews that we get are gonna reflect the current situation. And then when we go back to our normal self, to reopen the old profiles and to go back to the normality and have our online reputation as it was before, when we're able to give the same level of quality. Um, I think it is very important, it will, it will be really important to have that communication with the guests that you do have, that your online reputation is really important to you. Uh, that you know you're very well known for the service you've always given and then now that there are some restrictions that don't allow you to give the full experience that your hostel has always given and maybe to take that into consideration when when they do give you the the review or when they talk about it just to make them aware that it's really important to you that the current issues that you're having and the current um, challenges that you're facing are not reflected in your online reputation that will then scar you for, I don't know, 6, 12, 24 months, depend on which OTA they book from or Google or, or TripAdvisor. Um, Benita, you, you have your hand up. Yeah, but we, can, we can always surprise them. If we can't give them hugs and if, 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 if we can't just call them and, and, and have this physical uh, uh, close uh, uh, crossing I don't know how to say it. We can try to invent other kind of surprises, other kinds of, of um, small things that we can give them that they get surprised with it. Um, but we have to think about it. You never know. Tatiana is the one who knows how to do it. Yeah, Tatiana would be great to hear from and she's got her hand up. She's the uh... She's the online reputation expert. <laughs> Tatiana, you have to you have to unmute yourself, Tatiana. Why is that? Well, I'm sorry about this quarantine here. <laughs> but um, the thing is that I think that nowadays the world knows what is going on. And everyone wants to be safe. And everyone wants to be greeted the best way, the best way. And they know that there's some few limits for it. I don't think, I don't think people will not understand that we won't hug them. But sometimes more than that, just a smile or to greet them honestly, it's good enough to have them welcome. 
We don't need to be constantly next to them, touching them, kissing them. No, some of them don't even like that. And, and everyone wants to, to be at home, feel at home, and first of all, feel welcomed. And, and to make them feel welcomed, we don't need to be constantly doing things for them. We need to be sincere and, and to greet them. The rest comes with it. And I don't think that our online reputation is going to be worse because of that, because everyone knows what, what the world is living. And we're going to give them the best we can according to the measures that we need to have. Yeah, but Tatiana, like, I'd, I'd hate to debate with you because uh, I'm always on your side. <laughs> but I think, um, Good Morning Hostel having a 98% on Hostel World is because when people step, from the second they step in the door, they have an unforgettable experience, whether it's from the, the people that they meet, and I don't just mean the, the employees, but uh, the other guests, um, the, the happy hours that you guys do, the, the breakfast, the way it's served, uh, it's the whole experience, and that whole experience will not be the same. Now, again, we can, you know, we don't have to be on top of them, but to get 98, to get to 98% on Hustle World with the amount of reviews that Good Morning has, if you were to um, adapt yourself in these next few months for long-term stays, for students, people that are maybe are not interacting with each other in the same way, they don't, um, they don't come to the activities that you make, they don't interact with you in the same way on a short-term two-day basis, they may not rate you 100%. They might start picking a little bit more about, well, you know, the toilet didn't flush for me a couple times. Then your, your, your past customers that just came in had an unforgettable experience for two days and didn't care that the toilet didn't flush. So I think it's a different, it's a different microscope they're looking at now, when, when you're looking at students in long term, let's say, I mean, some hostels maybe will convert to kind of these B&Bs with automatic check-ins, but only for the next six months. So they'll have no contact or very little contact. They won't be able to maintain those ratings, but when they come back six months from now and are back to normal doing the actual check-in, having the full staff, having the atmosphere, they'll be stuck with six months of bad reviews because that person didn't have any contact with them because they didn't have any activities or atmosphere or because there was only 10 people in a hostel that usually has 200. So we definitely need to take into consideration that you know over the next six months our business model for most people are going to change whether it's forced or not and that's going to affect that's going to affect our reviews and our online reputations. And then once we bounce back and we get back to being the awesome hustles that we were, we're stuck with this kind of like six months of bad feedback or maybe not bad feedback, but not, not feedback that is coherent with what we're now going to be able to offer again. You know what I mean? So I think there's the challenge. Um, yeah, Tatiana. You know me already. <laughs> The thing is that, Lior, um, we're always thinking in advance, right? So what will be the measures? Do we need to be a meter and a half distance? Or can we be with them with a mask? Because uh, all of the rest can be done, even with long stay terms. Uh, not in good morning, in good morning, in the beginning of good morning hustle, we used to have long terms. Uh, long stay terms, but but nowadays we didn't accept them. But we used to have a lot before in Goodnight Hostel when we owned the, the Goodnight Hostel, and fortunately, it didn't. Um, we didn't have a problem with the online reputation. Just one or another case, of course, but uh, we didn't have a problem with that. We had a problem on the way that we could run the hostel because those were the problematic guests because we had they were feeling already too at home we they were the ones that we always had to to search for to wash their dishes to 
pick up their things because they left everything everywhere. But on the online reputation, no, we didn't have problems with that because we could make uh, we could make them fit with the, all the others. Okay, but nowadays we have another problem that is what are the measures that we are working with from now on. So after that, we can think about how to adjust the hostel in terms of that. Thanks, Tatiana. Um, it, yeah, we usually take an hour and a half, and so this would be over, but it seems like it's on a roll. And I do see that Linda had her hand up and Sylvia as well, which we haven't heard from. So it'd be great to, to hear from them. And then we can wrap this up. Uh, Linda, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, hi. Hey. <laughs> hi, everyone. Uh, no, I just, I wanted to say I, I agreed with you about uh, maintaining uh, online reputation, uh, simply because even though I'd like to think, you know, I like to think the best in people, for, <laughs> but uh, a lot of people, unfortunately, even in a situation like this, may not be as understanding. Uh, you know, our our last our last review on Hostel World was from someone who stayed with us while we were, had just got into a nationwide quarantine, and we were open essentially for these handful of people that were stuck there. And you know, we had no staff there; we didn't have anything going on, and they knew this because you know of the situation. And yet, they gave us. A not very great score on on hostel world <laughs> you know even considering the circumstances you know it's like what the fuck you know um so you know even though i'd like to think for the most part that people would be understanding of the situation and when things start slowly reopening those have to be kept in place you know i think it's it's best that that people try to communicate even before people arrive uh, what what the situation will be like you know a kind of damage control so to speak even before they arrive of what it will be like staying with you at that point do you know what i mean i think the harsh reality it's not necessarily whether we trust people to take into account uh, take into consideration the current situation it is that as well but the the, the reality of it is um, my experience with the beehive in Rome, which is where Linda's from, by the way, she didn't introduce herself, but my experience with the, the beehive in, in Rome might be usually, you know, 95, 100% or whatever, because of all the things that you do, you know, like whether it's because of the, the dinners, the cooking classes, whether it's about the activities that you do, about the, um, about the welcoming that I have from your staff, but in the new situation, my experience might not be the same because you might not have enough people to make a cooking class. You might not have enough um, customers in order to have a 24 hour or a you know, 12 hour reception. And so I might have less contact with people. So I mean that the, the temporary situation really should not, or we, we need to find a way um, to make it not affect our long-term reputation, you know, it's, um, it, it's definitely something we should, we need to look into. As I said, I've kind of started talking about it with Hostel World. Um, I, I, I'm reaching out to them to try to see what can be done, but that's just Hostel World. Then we have booking.com, we have Google, we have Facebook recommendations. We have a lot of other places that we need to worry about. So <clears throat> it is something taken into consideration that some people out there are creating new profiles um, and I don't, I don't mean new profiles on OTAs because I'm not even sure that they can do that. Um, but new profiles kind of like on Google and marketing themselves as something different temporarily. Again, I kind of um, urge against that because I think it's a lot, of, a lot of investment of time and energy for something that you may not need unless you're completely rebranding re yourself in the mid and long term. Um, but then we really do need to think about what can we do to minimize the change in our online reputation. Keeping in mind, everyone's online reputation is going to change, except those that can hibernate and not reopen until everything's back to normal. I don't think that's going to be many of them. So, I mean, I guess 
the good thing about it is that everyone will be facing the same situation at the same time and their ratings will also be reflected by it. Um, Sylvia, I'm going to let you have the last word. Um, Marina, oh. sorry, I know your hand's up um, and we've heard from you, so I just want to make sure that we got Sylvia an opportunity. Feel free to write what you wanted on the comments, okay? Sylvia. Well, I just want to say, do you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, I just want to say that we have been talking all the time about this temporary measure, but I do agree when we talk about the second wave, but also that first, as Tatiana said, we don't know exactly what the rules are going to be from each government, like when local or domestic tourists are going to come back or when international, but also we don't know how long it will gonna, it's going to take to to pass this crisis, you know, or if it won't be another crisis later. So I think we have to start to think in create this unforgettable experience in this new normality that is going to take longer than we expect. We are talking about doing some temporary change, but what if we create something that is not temporary and can work on the long term? At least this is what we have been talking in the lights, like what can we do that will create a new uh, experience or how we can sell ourselves to the domestic market but or this new market but at the same time we can use it for the long term because we don't really know if the short term will be short or it will be very long right now we are talking about uh, seeing that maybe the vaccines are in a year but the average is what five years uh, we don't know exactly what the rules are going to be uh, Tatiana said people want to travel yeah we have we know that our market, our targets, want to travel as soon as they can. But where are the rules the government are go is going to, to put on us? We have to maintain the distance. We have to use of protection. We don't. So how long these rules will be active? Maybe we have to think in more creative ways to have this experience so it doesn't affect to our reputation. It's like kind of thing all together. Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> Thanks, Sylvia. Something is definitely difficult, but uh, if you can create a wow out of the ow, they say, uh, then that would be ideal. All right, so um, thank you very much for joining everyone. I uh, really appreciate it. I think it was a very good talk. Um, I know it's a lot to think about, and these calls are like very weighing on the mind because there's so much uncertainty, so many different situations. But uh, together we are stronger and we're working through this. And I appreciate everyone who's come today to give their feedback and participate. And we'll see you next week. Thank you, everyone. Ciao.